We're now up to section three of the syllabus, which says that plants and animals regulate the concentration of gases, water and waste products of metabolism in cells and in interstitial fluid. So throughout the rest of this unit, these are the things we'll be looking at, how plants and animals keep uh, the concentrations of these things in their uh, necessary volumes or necessary concentrations. So the first two dot points we're going to look at are explain why the concentration of water in cells should be maintained within a narrow range for optimal function and explain why the removal of wastes is essential for continued metabolic activity. So to explain dot points, so we need to look at cause and effect of these two things. So firstly, let's have a look at water. So we know that water is extremely important. So because of its properties as a solvent, meaning that it's able to dissolve other substances, such as nutrients, oxygen, and wastes, it allows water to carry these things to and from the cells. Uh, water is used in nearly every chemical reaction in the body. Uh, so whether it's as a, um, a product or a reactant, water is necessary for these things. The concentration must be kept relatively constant in order to maintain pH, substrate concentrations and other necessary conditions. So as we know, maintaining pH and substrate concentrations are extremely important for our optimal enzyme activity. Water also has a very high heat capacity, which means that it can help to absorb and retain heat, therefore maintaining a constant body temperature. Again, important for our enzymes. As we know, if our temperature increases too much, our enzymes begin to denature, change shape, and no longer work. Water also acts as a lubricant and helps to prevent friction between surfaces, such as between opposing bony surfaces of our skeleton. So if we didn't have these lubricating, this lubricating uh, property of water, then we would end up with uh, problems such as arthritis and things where the bones rub against each other. So why do we need to get rid of wastes? So the excretory system involves several different organs that remove waste products from the body. They also help to regulate water and salt levels, <coughs> excuse me, and in effect help to maintain homeostasis. So the main metabolic wastes that we need to get rid of are excess water, carbon dioxide as we know, which decreases the pH and makes our blood acidic, excess salts and nitrogenous wastes such as urea and ammonia. So we'll be looking a lot more at nitrogenous wastes in the next slide and also in a few in future lessons when we specifically look at the role of the kidney. So the kidneys are the main excretory organ in the body and we'll be looking at these in much, much more detail as we move through. The respiratory system controls the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the respiratory system does also, uh, the lungs, sorry, are also considered to be excretory organs as they get rid of the waste, in particular, obviously, being carbon dioxide. And in order for carbon dioxide to be removed, it needs to diffuse out of the cells and into the capillaries and then travel in the blood to the lungs where it is exhaled. So the kidneys uh, and the lungs are two organs of excretion, the kidney being the most important uh, that we'll be having a look at now. So nitrogenous wastes are formed by the breakdown of amino acids, and amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, and they must be removed quickly as they have the ability to harm enzymes and slow down chemical reactions, change the pH, and interfere with the transport of substances across cell membranes. So if we, we recall back in the year 11 course where we looked at the structure of the cell membrane, we saw that there were um, proteins involved, protein channels involved that help to move substances into and out of the cell. So if we're not getting rid of these nitrogenous wastes, they can actually affect those proteins and hinder the movement of substances uh, that require them into and out of the cell. So unicellular organisms, so bacterial cells, paramecium, so organisms that obviously are only made up of one cell, are able to remove nitrogenous wastes by the simple processes of diffusion and osmosis. Uh, obviously, because they're, they're extremely small, they've got a large surface area to volume ratio, these substances are able to move in and out quite freely. Multicellular organisms such as ourselves are much too large to rely on these processes. 
So we can't simply have diffusion of substances out of our body to get rid of them. We need to have other processes in place. So active transport is required. And during active transport, ions are moved against a concentration gradient. So in diffusion and osmosis, substances simply move from where there's lots of them to where there's few of them. Whereas in active transport, we're able to have substances move from where there's few substances to where there's more substances. Uh, so this takes place in the kidney. Uh, so the kidneys have been developed for the purpose of active transport to get rid of these substances that we don't, don't require. So there's three main types of nitrogenous wastes. Ammonia is the simplest form of nitrogenous waste and takes very little energy to produce. The biggest issue is, however, it's highly toxic, so it needs to be removed immediately by diffusion or it is uh, excreted in very dilute urine. Urea, which is the main nitrogenous waste that we uh, produce, requires more energy to produce than ammonia. However, it is less toxic and therefore can be stored in the body for a longer period of time. And lastly, uric acid is uh, the nitrogenous waste that requires the most energy to produce. It is the least toxic. So again, even though it takes a lot of energy to produce, it can be stored for long periods of time and little water is required to remove it from the body. So if we have a look at the next slide, this looks at the different types of nitrogenous waste and the organisms that excrete it. So mammals, so kangaroos and humans, which live in terrestrial environments, excrete urea in our urine. So our urine can either have high levels or low levels of urea depending on uh, feedback from other parts of our body. So if we're hydrated, we've got lots of water, then uh, our urine will have more water, so it will be a sort of more diluted solution so that there'll still be urea excreted, but uh, more water will also be excreted as well. If we're in a situation where we are dehydrated, our uh, urine will be very concentrated with urea. It will have that dark yellowy, uh, almost brownie colour and will have a strong smell. So birds, which are also terrestrial organisms, excrete uric acid. So it's actually excreted as a paste. So um, that's that bird poo consistency where it's not actually a solid, not a liquid. And uh, yes, it is in fact has acidic properties. So if you ever get bird poop on your car, you want to try to get it off as quickly as possible so it doesn't eat away at your paint. Uh, insects, which are also terrestrial organisms, excrete uric acid as a paint, uh, sorry, a paste as well. And some insects are able to excrete ammonia across their body surface, depending on their size. Uh, now, fish, we look differently at freshwater fish versus saltwater fish, and this will come up again and again a few more times as we move through the topic. They're both obviously aquatic organisms, and they both excrete ammonia. However, um, with freshwater fish, because they're in a, in a situation where they're constantly taking in fresh water from their environment, their urine is very dilute. So it's got lots and lots of water, obviously, to try to keep that water balance between inside and outside the fish. And saltwater fish um, excrete concentrated urine because they're in an environment that's got lots of salt and only a little bit of water. They try to keep as much of that water in their bodies as possible, so excrete less water and uh, more ammonia. So that's the end of this video. And then as we move on, we're going to be looking specifically at the kidneys and their function in both mammals and also in looking at the difference between freshwater fish and saltwater fish.